Content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder and violence. Most people have heard about the Warren Commission. This was the commission tasked by President Lyndon Johnson with the task of investigating the assassination of President John F. Kennedy and figuring out exactly what happened. After close to a year's work, they released their report, which concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald, acting alone, had shot and killed JFK. What many people don't know is that there was actually a second federal-level investigation into the assassination. In 1976, Congress established the United States House Select Committee on Assassinations. They spent a couple of years investigating the JFK case and released their final report in 1979. They disagreed with the Warren Commission and concluded that there was a conspiracy in the case. So, why hasn't this gotten more attention? My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. We first connected while looking into the Burger Chef murders, an Indiana cold case. Together, we built a spreadsheet documenting hundreds of cases of restaurant-related homicides. That original spreadsheet gave way to our podcast, The Murder Sheet. Now we maintain that same research-centric, investigative approach as we look into all sorts of homicides, including unsolved cases, historical crimes, and, of course, restaurant murders. We don't just chat about the headlines. Our podcast is a platform for our journalism. The Murder Sheet focuses on investigative reporting, thoughtful analysis, thorough research, and in-depth interviews. We're the Murder Sheet. And this is the JFK assassination. Lingering Questions. One thing that was interesting about the House Select Committee of Assassinations' conclusion that there was a conspiracy is that it almost seemed designed to please no one. It obviously disappointed people who maintained that Oswald acted alone, but it also left conspiracy theorists frustrated. According to the committee, the conspiracy to kill the president did not involve any of the most common suspects people have put forth over the years. It did not involve the CIA, the FBI, or the Secret Service. It did not involve any organized crime group or any group of anti-Castro Cubans. It also did not involve any foreign governments, which means that Cuba or the Soviet Union were not part of any plan to murder JFK. It is actually a little difficult to figure out who exactly the HSCA thought might have been a part of the conspiracy. In fact, many observers thought the committee was on its way to concluding there was actually no conspiracy at all. So what on earth changed their mind? Well, basically, the committee came across a single piece of evidence so compelling that they believed it alone was enough to conclusively prove there was a conspiracy. Before we get into what exactly that was, we need to step back a moment. Oswald fired three shots at the presidential motorcade, and we know that for a couple of different reasons. There were three expended shells found in Oswald's sniper nest, and also a man named Abraham Zapruder, by mere happenstance, filmed the assassination on his home movie camera. His film gives us at least a rough idea of how long the assassination took from the first shot to the final fatal shot. And going by that timetable, Oswald would not have had time to fire more than three shots. We will return to this idea when we talk about the so-called magic bullet theory in a future episode. 
But that's basically what you need to know. Oswald could not have fired more than three shots. So, if you find conclusive evidence of a fourth shot, then you have therefore proven that there was a second gunman. And a second gunman means there had to have been a conspiracy. This brings us, at last, to the HSCA's blockbuster evidence of conspiracy. On November 22, 1963, a Dallas motorcycle police officer's microphone somehow got stuck in the on position. That meant that everything his mic picked up ended up getting recorded on a dicta belt. So, if that motorcycle officer happened to be in Dealey Plaza at the time of the shooting, then that could very well mean that we have an audio recording of the assassination itself. And there was certainly no shortage of people willing to claim that that was exactly the case. But from the very beginning, there were a couple of problems. For one thing, there wasn't any crowd noise on the recording. And if the recording was actually made in the middle of Dealey Plaza, that sort of noise should definitely have been present. And also, there was this small matter that you don't actually hear any gunshots on the recording. But that didn't stop some experts from taking this recording incredibly seriously. Riflemen headed down to Dealey Plaza and were recorded firing their weapons from the Texas School Book Depository and from a nearby grassy knoll, where some people believed they heard shots. What experts called impulse patterns from those shots were compared to the so-called police recording from November 22, 1963. The experts concluded that the recording picked up the sound of four shots, three of which had been fired from Oswald's location in the Texas School Book Depository, and one of which had been fired from the knoll. This clearly indicated there was a conspiracy. But it also raised a curious issue. All of the shots that hit Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly were consistent with having come from the rear, which was Oswald's location. None of the shots that hit them came from the front. This means that the so-called fourth shot that was supposedly fired from the grassy knoll had to have completely missed. And it would have needed to have missed not just the men in the car, but also the car itself, since the vehicle did not show any sign of being hit from a shot from the front. So, even though the alleged Noel gunman would have had an excellent vantage point to fire the fatal shot, he would have had to be an absolute terrible marksman. And why would the conspiracy have selected a person like that to fill such an important role? And even if he completely missed the motorcade, shouldn't there have been some trace of the bullet he fired? Could it really have simply disappeared altogether? Well, it's probably not worth spending much time pondering such questions, because soon after the release of the HSCA report, the recording evidence fell apart. A magazine distributed a copy of the recording with one of its issues. An assassination researcher named Steve Barber listened to it, and he noticed a detail that somehow all of the experts had missed. At the point in the recording at which the shots were supposedly being fired, there was a voice in the background ordering officers to secure the scene. That order was spoken by Sheriff Bill Decker about 90 seconds after the shots were fired, and not while the shots were being fired. In our minds, Barber's discovery in and of itself was enough to show that the impulse patterns could not possibly be the sound of gunshots, and that the HSCA made a serious error when they relied on it to conclude there was a conspiracy. The FBI subsequently did their own analysis of the recording, and concluded there was no evidence that it contained the sound of gunshots, or even that it was actually recorded in Dealey Plaza. All of the excitement over this alleged acoustic evidence had just been a huge waste of time. We've gone into so much detail on this Dicta Belt recording because we think it is a good example of something we have seen happen time and time again in this case. Namely, a piece of evidence is put out there by some good-intentioned people it seems to indicate there was a conspiracy, but when that evidence is examined more closely, it falls apart. This has happened over and over again, 
in ways both large and small. Here is another quick example of that. And keep in mind, in this bit, we're going to use words like tramps, which are somewhat dehumanizing words to describe unhoused people. We're just using the common parlance to keep things clear and to match the diction that conspiracy theorists have used in the past. Shortly after the assassination, the police arrested three tramps and led them through Dealey Plaza. Reporters took photographs of them, and these pictures were widely circulated. It did not take people long to start speculating about these men. People said that they were too well-dressed and well-groomed to be transients, that they were more likely to be members of an assassination hit team. Some authors and self-proclaimed photography experts even went to the incredible lengths of claiming that they had definitively identified these alleged tramps. Of course, these identifications often contradicted each other. Some claimed that the photos showed men who later were involved in the Watergate scandal. There were also attempts to prove that the men were either a contract killer named Charles Harrelson or a man named Charles Rogers. Rogers has not been seen since killing his parents in 1965, but some have theorized with absolutely no evidence that he was also a CIA agent. A man named Chauncey Holt even came forward and claimed that he was one of the tramps that he was also a CIA agent, and that he had played a minor role in the assassination. And yes, Charles Harrelson happens to be the father of successful actor Woody Harrelson. Some of these tales can be interesting to read, but the problem is that none of them were true. In 1992, reporters Ray and Mary LaFontaine dug up the arrest records for the three tramps. Those records identified the trio as Gus W. Abrams, Harold Doyle, and John F. Gedney. None of these men had any connection to the CIA or Watergate or the JFK assassination. They were just what they had always been purported to be, three random homeless men. Tracked down by reporters, Doyle explained that the reason the men looked a bit better dressed than some might expect is that they had spent the night before the assassination in a homeless shelter and so had been able to shower and clean up. And so once again... Another major argument from the conspiracy side of the fence has been shown to have no merit. We always love to cover a good historical mystery on the murder sheet, so it's not a huge shock that our favorite game is all about a 1920s detective hot on the trail of all sorts of strange happenings. We're talking about June's Journey. It's a free-to-download hidden object game, and it's utterly delightful. You play as June Parker, a sleuth from the 1920s. In each level, you inspect scenes for hidden clues. I play so much that I'm already on chapter 12. To advance levels, you get to decorate your own personal island estate. I love collecting different features, like a beautiful swan pond, a swirling windmill, and a gaggle of old-time reporters. I'm very proud of all of those. Whenever I'm solving mysteries, I get to travel everywhere from Cuba to Paris to Italy to investigate cases involving artistic scandals, blackmail, and murder most foul. One thing that makes June's journey special for me is the lovely artwork underpinning each level. The attention to detail really makes each scene come alive, and the characters are packed with personality. It's really immersive and makes us feel like we've been dropped into an old-fashioned mystery story. I can get a bit antsy whenever I'm stuck waiting in line or on hold during a call. June's Journey is a great respite, a chance to play a fun game and get a mental boost while I'm at it. Find your first clue by downloading June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. Now, these examples are actually instances of things working more or less the way they are supposed to. An interesting story comes up, it is researched and debunked, and then it is more or less forgotten. All too often, things turn out differently. All too often, something comes up, is debunked, and then a few years later, someone digs it up again and puts it in a new TV show or book about the case. Here's an example of that, which comes from a listener. I once saw a show that discussed in quite a bit of detail about a theory that at least one of the shots likely came from a Secret Service agent in the car behind JFK's and was an accidental discharge. It seems very possible to me the way it was presented, but I've never seen anything else cover that angle. Is that something you've researched at all? And if so, do you find it plausible? This is an interesting theory that definitely caught my eye. 
I first heard about it in a book called Mortal Error by a writer named Bonar Menninger. The theory itself was put together by a ballistics expert named Howard Donahue. I'm not going to name the Secret Service agent they identified as firing the shot. Basically, the hypothesis was that this agent was in a car just behind the president. When the gunshot started ringing out, he stood and took out his weapon. The vehicle he was in then sped up and he fell back, accidentally firing his weapon. And it was this shot that hit the president in the head, killing him. But there are a couple of problems. First of all, there were plenty of people around at the time. They had come to see the president drive by. Not one of these witnesses reported seeing the agent stand up like he would have had to do to fire the shot. Now, as we know, eyewitnesses can be wrong. They can make mistakes. They can miss things. So it is worth noting that we have something better than an eyewitness. We have a film. You've all probably seen the famous Zabruder film of the assassination. What's less known is that that is not the only footage that exists of the shooting. A man named Charles Bronson, not the actor, also shot film of the murder. Unlike the Zabruder film, the Bronson film shows the follow-up car with the Secret Service agent at the time of the fatal shot. It depicts him neither standing nor pointing his weapon at the president. Based on all of that, I feel we can conclusively rule out this theory. Another listener brought up the issue of Victoria Adams. This is something especially interesting because it initially seems like a rather small detail, but if you follow the thread, it actually has the potential to prove that Oswald fired no shots at JFK, that there was in fact a conspiracy. In fact, a book has even been written about her called The Girl on the Stairs. So who is Victoria Adams and why on earth is she so important? To answer that, we need to go back to the very moment of the shooting. At that time, Adams was inside the Texas School Book Depository, the very same building from which Lee Harvey Oswald fired the shots that killed the president. But he was on the sixth floor and Victoria was on the fourth According to the story, as it is sometimes told, as soon as Victoria heard the third shot, she raced to the stairs and ran down to the ground floor. And she did not see anyone else on those steps. The problem is that according to the so-called official story, immediately after the shooting, Oswald, on the sixth floor, went to those very same steps and dashed down to the second floor. And we know he was on the second floor because he was seen there by police officer Marion Baker about 90 seconds after the last shot was fired. If both Oswald and Victoria were running down the stairs immediately after the killing, then it is difficult to understand how Victoria could have missed seeing Oswald. That, of course, raises the possibility that maybe he didn't have to go down those stairs at all. That maybe he was actually on the second floor at the time of the assassination. And in fact... Oswald told the police he was on the second floor when the shots were fired. Victoria's story, if taken at face value, would seem to lend credibility to Oswald's alibi, which therefore would support the idea of a conspiracy. But before we come to that conclusion, let's step back a bit and take a closer look at Victoria's story. Like so much in true crime, it all comes down to the timeline. If she was on that stairway in the instant after the assassination, then yes, she should have seen Oswald. But if it took her just a minute and a half to reach the steps, well, then Oswald would have already had time to run down to the second floor and exit the stairway. So in that case, there would have been no reason for her to see him. It all comes down to how long it took her to get to the stairs. Let's try to figure that out. And to do that, let's go back to the source. Here is what Victoria Adams herself said when she testified to the Warren Commission. And after the third shot, following that, the third shot, I went to the back of the building down the back stairs and encountered Bill Shelley and Bill Lovelady on the first floor on the way out. Shelley and Lovelady were two men who also worked at the Texas School Book Depository. And it is fortunate that Victoria mentioned them because it gives us another way to figure out the timeline. In short, if we can figure out when exactly Shelley and Lovelady were walking into the building, then we can know when Victoria reached the bottom of those stairs. 
Here is the relevant quote from the Warren report. Shelley and Lovelady have testified that they were watching the parade from the top step of the building entrance when a woman who works in the depository ran up and said that the president had been shot. Lovelady and Shelley moved out into the street. About this time, Shelley saw Patrolman Baker go into the building, where he would encounter Oswald on the second floor. Shelley and Lovelady, at a fast walk or trot, turned west into the railroad yards and then to the west side of the depository building. They re-entered the building by the rear door minutes after Baker rushed through the entrance. On entering, Lovelady saw a girl on the first floor who he believes was Victoria Adams. If Miss Adams accurately recalled meeting Shelley and Lovelady when she reached the bottom of the stairs, then her estimate of the time when she descended from the fourth floor is incorrect, and she actually came down the stairs several minutes after Oswald and after Baker as well. That makes it pretty clear. Lovelady saw Victoria as she left the building, and she saw him. He was not that spot to be seen until well after Oswald had been in that stairway. There was therefore no reason we should have expected Victoria to have seen Oswald. Her story therefore does not contradict the so-called official story even a bit. But what about witnesses who do have stories that contradict the idea that Oswald acted alone? Do those tales hold up to scrutiny? As an example, let's take a look at the claims of witness Jean Hill. Some of you may be familiar with Hill's story, It was dramatized in the Oliver Stone movie, JFK. Hill and her friend, Mary Mormon, went to Dealey Plaza, hoping to get a picture of JFK as he drove by. They stood near the side of the street, and Mormon did indeed manage to capture an image of the president, just after he was hit by the first bullet. But it is what happened next that seems truly significant. Hill, incidentally, said she heard four to six shots fired. This was more than Oswald could have possibly fired, and in and of itself would therefore point to there being a conspiracy. But that is just the beginning. Hill also said she saw a shooter on the so-called grassy knoll. This clearly could not have been Oswald. She also claimed that she immediately ran across the street to chase this person, and that, in fact, she dashed across the road so quickly she was nearly hit by one of the motorcycles in the presidential motorcade. Somewhere around this time, she also said she spotted Jack Ruby running from the school book depository. Ruby, of course, would go on to shoot and kill Oswald a couple of days later. If he was fleeing from the school book depository at the time of the assassination, it would tend to support the idea that there was a conspiracy. But Hill's story soon gets even more dramatic. It is at this point that Hill says she was seized by men claiming to be Secret Service agents. These men took her to another location and browbeat her, trying to scare her into saying she only heard three shots fired. And again, it seems pretty clear that if government agencies were in fact pressuring witnesses to change their story of what they saw, well, that would certainly seem to suggest some sort of conspiracy or cover-up. So how do we approach a story like this? There are a few things we need to do. The first question I'd want to ask when a person tells a story like this is, has this person always told this same story, or has it changed over the years? Hill's story is dramatic, and surely, if true, would have been one of the most significant events of her entire life. If her tale was true, I think we could expect her story to remain fairly consistent over the years. Now, how do we evaluate it if her story has changed? The principle most people tend to take in instances like that is that the earlier an account is, the more likely it is to be most accurate. The further away you get from an event, the more likely it is to be less accurate. So in other words, if I ask you to tell me about what you did on Christmas 2022, I imagine you would give me a pretty solid and reliable account. If I asked you what you did on, say, Christmas 2009, maybe your story wouldn't be quite as detailed or accurate. But if you wrote a note about Christmas 2009 a week after the holiday, well, we would certainly be more inclined to trust that over whatever you remember about it today. With all that in mind, 
we will note that the highly dramatic story Hill told late in life was quite different from what she told reporters and law enforcement back in 1963. Back then, she said nothing about seeing a shooter on the grassy knoll, for instance. And she also did not claim to have been detained by bullying Secret Service agents, who seemed determined to keep her from spreading the story that she heard four to six shots. All of those rather colorful details came much, much later. The fact that she changed her story like that makes us automatically skeptical of Hill. But let's be careful not to jump to any premature conclusions. Another necessary step when evaluating a story like this is to try to figure out if it's possible to find any corroborating evidence. In other words, are there people or photographs that back up what Hill had to say? The short answer is that there is not. And in fact, the available evidence actually contradicts Hill's story. There are, for instance, a large number of photographs taken in and around Dealey Plaza just after the assassination. It is easy to spot Hill in these images because she was wearing a distinctive red coat. Photos taken by Wilma Bond in particular clearly show that Hill did not immediately take off running in pursuit of a gunman on the grassy knoll seconds after the shooting. Instead, she actually sat down for a moment, and then rose and stood for a bit. By the time she headed for the knoll, other people were already heading in that direction. And then there is the whole story about Secret Service agents detaining and bullying her into changing her story. That simply did not happen. We know that because Jean Hill was with a friend that day, Mary Mormon, and Mormon does not back up Hill's story. Mormon instead agrees with the account given by a man named Jim Featherstone. He was a reporter for a local paper. We are going to read his story now, which you can find online at jfk-online.com. I ran to Dealey Plaza a few yards away, and this is where I first learned the president had been shot. I found two young women, Mary Mormon and Jean Lawless Hill, near the curb on Dealey Plaza. Both had been within a few feet of the spot where Kennedy was shot, and Mary Mormon had taken a Polaroid picture of Jackie Kennedy, cradling the president's head in her arms. It was a poorly focused and snowy picture, but as far as I knew then, it was the only such picture in existence. I wanted the picture, and I also wanted the two women's eyewitness accounts to the shooting. I told Mrs. Mormon I wanted the picture for the Times-Herald, and she agreed. I then told both of them I would like for them to come with me to the courthouse press room so I could get their stories, and both agreed. Mrs. Hill gave a graphic account of seeing Kennedy shot a few feet in front of her eyes. Before long, the press room became filled with other newsmen. Mrs. Hill told her story over and over again for television and radio. Each time, she would embellish it a bit until her version began to sound like Dodge City at high noon. She told of a man running up towards the now-famed Grassy Knoll, pursued by other men she believed to be policemen. In the meantime, I talked to other witnesses, and at one point I told Mrs. Hill she shouldn't be saying some of the things she was telling television and radio reporters. I was merely trying to save her later embarrassment, but she apparently attached intrigue to my warning. As the afternoon wore on, a deputy sheriff found out that I had two eyewitnesses in the press room and he told me to ask them not to leave the courthouse until they could be questioned by law enforcement people. I relayed the information to Mrs. Mormon and Mrs. Hill. All this time, I was wearing a lapel card identifying myself as a member of the press. It was also evident we were in the press room, and the room was so designated by a sign on the door. I am mentioning all of this because a few months later, Mrs. Hill told the Warren Commission bad things about me. She told the commission that I had grabbed Mrs. Mormon and her camera down on Dealey Plaza, and that I wouldn't let her go even though she was crying. She added that I stole the picture from Mrs. Mormon. Mrs. Hill then said I had forced them to come with me to a strange room, and then would not let them leave. She also said I had told her what she could and could not say. Why Mrs. Hill said all of this has never been clear to me. I later theorized she got swept up in the excitement of having the cameras and lights on her, and microphones shoved into her face. 
she was suffering from a sort of star is born syndrome, I later figured. And as we said before, Mary Mormon supports the story told by Featherstone and disputes the story told by Hill. Jean Hill, in our view, just isn't credible. It is outrageous that so many outlets, like Stone's mendacious JFK film, have repeated her story to audiences without explaining the many, many problems with it. The reason so many people believe there was a conspiracy in this case, the reason why so many people believe there was a conspiracy in this case is because they have been lied to or misled by sources they trusted. And the non-critical spreading of Gene Hill's story is a great example of that problem. Let's make another quick point before leaving the subject of Hill. The explosive information that government agencies were supposedly so desperate for her to keep hidden was the fact that she thought she heard four to six shots. It has been very well known since almost immediately after the assassination that different witnesses thought they heard different numbers of shots. The majority of people heard three or fewer, but there are some who believe they heard more. That is not top secret or damaging information, as most people understand that eye or ear witness testimony is notoriously unreliable, especially in a traumatic event like this. And when it comes to trusting the quality of Hill's perceptions, it may be worth pointing out that she also reported seeing a dog in the presidential car. There was no dog in that vehicle. If Hill could be wrong about a simple detail like that, it is easy to imagine that she could also be mistaken about the number of shots that were fired. Before we wrap this episode up, we have a couple of quick notes. First of all, this second part has taken a lot longer to put together than we planned. Apologies for that. There have been quite a few ongoing developments in the other cases we cover, and so that has meant this episode has kept getting pushed back. Again, we apologize for that. We definitely plan to do future episodes on this case, but it will probably be a while before the next one comes out, and we ask for your understanding and patience. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murdersheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.